So I want you to imagine along with me this morning that you're going on a road trip. You're going on a holiday. It's somewhere you've never been before. It's a long journey and there's lots to experience along the way. There's lots to see along the way. Scott's friends are on a holiday right now. They're in the United States. They went to Montana and then down to Idaho and then into Utah. You can read tourist books ahead of time. You can ask people where to visit. You can ask people what it will be like. You can plan your trip. But if you've never been there before, it will always be different from what you expected. It won't be quite what you imagined. And Scott's friend describes the crazy change of scenery from rocky mountains to potato fields to giant red rock cliffs just popping out of the ground. I thought, that's pretty incredible. And I thought, that's like reading scriptures. The Old Testament prophets tell of a coming Messiah, what he'll do, and they describe Jesus' death. Jesus told the disciples that he was going to die and that he was going to rise again. But no one understood. They had different expectations of why he had come and what he would do. And when Jesus died, his disciples didn't say, everything's on track, just what we are expecting. No. They were devastated. And then they were shocked and they were afraid when he rose from the dead and came and was with them three days later. He was alive. It was not at all what they were expecting. These last weeks, we've been talking about Jesus' return. And I believe it's the same today. Lots of books have been written about the end times over many, many years. People buy these books. I've read some of them. They spell out everything that's going to happen in all the details, all the dates, the times, the scripture references. And when it doesn't happen when they say, they change the date and they write a new book. We've been looking at what Jesus had on his mind as he walked on the earth over the last few weeks. What did Jesus want us to know about his return? Well, Jesus spent a lot of time talking about the kingdom of God and what it meant for us to be kingdom people and live as part of the kingdom of God right now. He says, he says don't be afraid or alarmed. Trust God. No one knows when the end will come, when I will return. I'm going to prepare a place for you, because I can hardly wait to be with you. Make sure you're ready. Live faithful for me. Live faithfully for me. Keep alert. Be salt and light and witnesses for me. Love people as I've loved you. All of those things are things that we do. And it seems to me that what was really important to Jesus was what we do, how we live, rather than to know the details about his return. Today we want to look at Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. In Acts chapter 17, it tells us about Paul and Silas's time in Thessalonica. They shared the gospel with the Jews and the Gentiles. The Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Christ. Numbers of men and women believed him, both Jews and Gentiles. But many of the Jews didn't, and they were angry. And Paul and Silas were forced to flee the city for their safety. And yet the church continued to grow. And Paul writes letters to the saints in Thessalonica as a way of continuing to build his relationship with them and he encourages them in their faith. And he encourages them to stay strong in the midst of persecution. And he urges them to live holy and pleasing lives to God. Like Jesus, that was Paul's first concern too. It was how we live. And then he addressed some of their questions about Jesus' return. First question was, how are Christians to understand death? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 are words that are often read at a funeral. And Paul tells them, we don't want you to be ignorant about, these, about those who have fallen asleep, 
He says, we want you to understand what's happening. And he goes on to say, we don't want you to grieve like the rest of people who have no hope. Paul compares death to falling asleep. If you're sleepy, you wake up again. And I'm reminded of the story of Jairus' daughter who dies. And when Jesus gets there, he says, she's just asleep. And the people laugh at her. At la they laugh at them and at him. For those who die, that wake up will be when Jesus returns. And Paul doesn't try to explain what happens to them after they die. He doesn't talk about where they are or what's going on. He knows that no matter what, that they are with God and they are in God's care. And that's our hope. It's not knowing details of what, what, where they might be. And he says, because Jesus died and rose again, we believe God will bring with Jesus those who've fallen asleep in him. The Thessalonians are confused. Believe it or not, back in that day, they expected that Jesus was going to be returning very, very soon. That's 2,000 years ago. They expected Jesus' return at that time. They didn't expect that they were going to be facing persecution and death for their faith. And they're wondering what's going on. They wonder what happens to those who've died. Where are they? And Paul tells them that those who have died, they aren't at a disadvantage. There's nothing wrong. He says, we who are living when the Lord returns won't meet him ahead of those who've died. He says, Jesus will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Jesus is coming as a triumphant king. And it will be loud, and it will be noticeable, and it'll be loud enough to waken the dead. Now, I want to look at a few of these words that are in, in these scriptures. And it, it, that word command, with a loud command, that word can mean shout. And it's a word of encouragement. When, uh, when uh, yesterday the riders played, when the team runs onto the field, the, the, the fans cheer and, and loudly shout their encouragement. That's what that word shout means. It's like encouraging a sports team as they run onto the field. Maybe a jockey is on his horse and they're running and getting closer to the finish line and he shouts wanting the horse to run faster. It's a word of encouragement. It's, and I suggest that it's not only a word of, of encouragement. In the case of Jesus coming back, it's a shout of joy. And it's a shout of hope. Jesus is returning for his own with a loud shout. What a delight, what a blessing that will be. And Paul says Jesus will come down from heaven. He will descend. Again, we've got to realize when we re read these passages that Peter, that Paul, I'm sorry, Paul is using metaphors. He's using language and, and images that we can understand to try to portray something that is indescribable. So when he says that Jesus is going to descend, he's not talking about Jesus in a physical way, that he's way up beyond the farthest galaxy in, in, in the universe, and that he's coming down from there to earth. In Colossians 3, verse 4, Paul writes, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him. So what does that look like? Appear means to make manifest or to make known or visible. We don't know exactly what that's going to look like. It's like a tourist book describing the Grand Canyon to someone who's lived their lives on the flat prairies and never been anywhere else. How can we possibly imagine what the Grand Canyon's going to look at like when we've, all we've seen is flat prairie? If God wanted us to know more, if he thought it was important for us to know more, he would have told us more. But he gives us these images, these metaphors, these pictures that, that describe something that should make us excited and make us thankful and encourage us that, yes, he's returning. And Paul says that after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. That word caught up means to snatch up, 
or to seize. So we have this picture of Jesus descending, the dead in Christ rising first, and then the rest of us caught up into the air to meet him in the air. And that word caught up is the same word that's used in the Old Testament where it talks about the Israelites leaving camp and going out to the mountain, Mount Sinai, to meet God. And it's also a word that is used that when the emperor would come and visit one of the colonies, the people from that city would go out and they would meet the emperor and then with great fanfare they would all go back to the city again. Very formal and very full of, of pageantry and, and pomp and circumstance. That's the same language that is used when it says, together we meet the Lord in the air. It doesn't mean that we're going to necessarily stay in the air with him. Like the citizens, we, it may be that we come back down to earth with Jesus again. We don't know. But we do know that Jesus is going to return. He's going to return for the living and the dead. And that we are going to be with him forever. And Paul says this is how, as Christians, we are to understand death. And what a day that will be. And Paul says, encourage each other with these words. I love the, that. I love to share that at a funeral because it says, encourage each other. We grieve, but yet we encourage. This is our hope and this is our joy. And again, we don't need to know more. So Paul goes on to address the second question. When will Jesus return? Isn't that a question that we would all like answered? When is he going to return? Give us a time. Give us a date. Give us a, more of a clue. Then we can be ready. As I said, the Thessalonians were expecting that Jesus could return any day. And that's why they were concerned about their friends and their family dying. In our day, these passages are often used to cause anxiety and fear. They're sensationalized. Will we be left behind? Are we going to be good enough to go? Paul is writing these answers to real life questions of that day. When will Jesus return? And he says, friends, about times and dates. We don't need to write you. It's quite an abrupt answer. <laughs> but Paul's not writing a timetable of the end times like the writers today. He's not writing a step-by-step -step process of what's going to happen and when. He tells them that there's hope. There's hope for those who have died. There's hope for those who are still living. No one is forgotten. We grieve, yes. But when we know that our loved one knew Jesus and has gone to be with the Lord, we grieve as those who have hope. We don't grieve as those who have no hope. And we, when Jesus returns, we are all going to be with him forever. He says, be encouraged. We don't need to be concerned about dates and about times. Jesus will return when least expected. And he uses the language of like a thief in the night. When people are saying safety and peace. He says, like a woman suddenly going into labor. There will be those who will be caught off guard. But Paul says, that's not you. You won't be caught off guard. He says, you are, you are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are sons of the light. You are sons of the day. You are already sons of the light, sons of the day. The new life that Jesus came, the new kingdom that Jesus came, the kingdom of God is already here. It's already broken into our world. And we are people of that kingdom now. We are sons and daughters of the light. And it's all through Jesus' life and his death and his resurrection. We're already people of the spirit, the people of the kingdom of God. We belong to this new world already. We are already awake. So he says, don't live like those who are in darkness. He says, be alert, be self-controlled. Put on faith and love as your breastplate and hope of salvation as your helmet. For you've been appointed to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. These words just thrilled me again as I read them uh, over this last week. They're such great wor uh, verses. There's no need to worry. It says, Jesus died for us so that whether we're awake or asleep, whether you're dead or still alive, we will live together with him. 
And he says, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up as, in fact, you are doing. Encourage each other. Support each other. Be there for each other. Keep doing it. And I had to think of the little song, Jesus is coming back someday. Could be any time of day. Jesus is coming back, I know. The Holy Spirit told me so. So praise the Lord. Shout hallelujah, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Jesus is coming back. Scott's friends were at the Grand Canyon yesterday. From what I understand, it's the first time that they've been there. And she wrote, it's beautiful and it's amazing. A tangible representation of God's majesty in his creation. I've never been to the Grand Canyon. I'm hoping that we will get there someday. No matter the pictures I've seen and how much I've heard about it, being there will beyond, be beyond anything that I could possibly imagine. Something about seeing in person versus a picture. There's something about seeing instead of hearing about it. We don't know the month or the day or the year when Jesus will return. We don't have to. We don't know if we will rise with that first bunch because we've already went to be with the Lord or we will, if we will rise to meet him in the air as living. But we can live with joy and with peace and with hope and with wonder as we wait for that day. We can live as children of the light as we wait for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So be encouraged with these words. Let's pray together. Lord God, I thank you for each brand new day you give us. Thank you for the joy and the wonder and the amazement of being children of God of living each day with you and for you. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who lives within us and walks with us. Thank you, Jesus, for your promise that one day you will return to take us to be with you forever. And what a day that will be. In the meantime, I pray, O oh God, that you'll grant us grace and hope and joy as we live each day for you. May we be witnesses to the wonder of what you have done in our lives and in the wonder of what you can do in the lives of friends and family, those around us. Lord, may we rest in your care in the knowing that you are going to return someday. And whether that's soon or whether it's not for a long time yet, that we are with you. I just thank you so much for your word, O oh God. Such a comfort and such an encouragement to us. May we rest in that, in that comfort and in that encouragement. Lord, I pray your blessing on each one here. I pray that as we go into this next week, we will know and experience the joy of living for you, of knowing you in each day when we open our eyes till the time we close our eyes at night, that we belong to you. When we've committed ourselves to you, we belong to you. You know us, and I just thank you. So I pray as we head into this week, I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you walk with us. I pray that as we interact with people, that we may be able to share the goodness of Jesus Christ with those around us in our words and our actions. And that as we have been blessed, we may be a blessing to others in Jesus' name. Amen. May our Lord Jesus Christ and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and keep you blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Amen.